So what is a PET scan analogous to? If you can imagine injecting tiny little light bulbs that go to a patient's heart, and then the camera is measuring at what light is coming out and creating a picture from that light. That's about as close as I could come to any type of analogy, but what I just described clearly uh, isn't real. So nuclear imaging from a cardiovascular perspective is a non-invasive technique where we're able to look at various aspects of the heart, whether it be function or flow, a variety of different components of the heart, using nuclear materials that are injected into the bloodstream. Uh, they're safe, they're quickly expelled, but they provide unique information about the heart and the heart function. Nuclear imaging and cardiology evolved alongside each other throughout the 1900s their paths gradually interweaving as our knowledge of both fields broadened until the two were united through the modern advancements in technology. We've been looking into the human body for over 100 years, but how did we get there? November the 8th, 1895, X-rays are discovered by German physicist Wilhelm Röntgen. He takes the first X-ray image showing the skeletal structure of his wife's left hand. 1911, the first practical application of a radioisotope used by George de Hevesy. 1924, the American Heart Association is formed. 1929, the first right heart catheterization is performed by Werner Forsman on himself. Later, 1950s, Framingham Heart Study identifies saturated fat as a cause of heart disease. First attempts at urging Americans to change their diets for better heart health. October 30th, 1958, first coronary angiogram is accidentally performed by cardiologist F. Mason Soames. 1960s, first usages of endoscopes and bypass surgery. 1973, first myocardial stress perfusion imaging is performed using potassium-43 radioactive tracers. 1974, the first PET camera is developed. 1980s, first use of stents, and MRI scanners are installed in hospitals. 2000, Time Magazine names the PET-CT scanner the medical invention of the year. PET is an acronym for positron emission tomography. And it's a fancy way of saying taking pictures using positrons. So the obvious question is, what is a positron? So a positron is a certain type of particle that's the size of an electron but has an actual opposite charge of an electron. And positrons have a strange uh, and unique property that when they run into an electron, both the electron and the positron vanish. Their mass disappears and the energy is released in a straight line 180 degrees apart. So what we do is we take a camera and that can identify these energy waves that come across and we put the camera around the person. The PET camera looks a lot like a CT scanner or an MRI machine in that the patient lies on a gantry and is encircled by the camera. So the camera goes 360 degrees around the patient and as these positrons leave the patient's body they're hitting the PET camera all around the patient. And that enables us to collect the data or the information uh, from the patient's heart. Because we are able to not only take pictures of where that radioactive material went to in the heart, but we can measure numbers of how quickly it got there, we're able to really put together a treatment plan, really even without knowing what's going on with the patient. So we're now in our reading room, which is where all of the images, after the camera has acquired them and process all the data, all of that data and images are sent into this area where we can pull everything up on monitors and make our clinical interpretation and do our reports. The, the way that we do it is we inject the radio tracer, which is like little light bulbs, 
that go inside and then shine the light and then our camera measures all of that light and what the camera uh, and computer systems will do is now take all of those light beams that were emitted and it's going to make an image of a heart we measure not only where the light comes out of the heart okay but how fast it's doing so and that's where things become very complicated and that's really where the power of PET is, where we can measure the, the speed of the blood moving through the heart itself. So this is an example of a normal study. And you can see there's no chunks of green or blue or any dark splotches. Everything is nice and uniform and it looks pretty. But as we look at some abnormal studies, um, we want to focus on when there is blue capacity, that's when really stents and bypass surgeries really help. When there's no blue, you're not seeing a, a benefit with bypass and stents uh, from a mortality standpoint. You're not seeing a reduction in heart attacks if you're doing procedures when there's no blue. So this is another example um, of a patient who actually, uh, for other reasons, had an angiogram and it was recommended that he actually have bypass surgery. And the patient really felt well and questioned the need for bypass and ended up coming to us to get a PET scan to determine uh, really if, if the bypass was necessary. I was running a 5K and uh, noticed that I was short of breath after about a mile which is a little unusual, but thought, well, I'm getting older, not in as good a shape as I used to be. I had my annual checkup with my primary care physician, told him about these instances, and uh, he said, well, why don't we do a stress test? The stress test revealed what they call a left bundle block. After receiving an angiogram, I was suggested to have bypass surgery. When a patient goes for an angiogram, we're basically getting an anatomic assessment, meaning we're able to see that patient's arteries and if there's plaque in there or if there's blockage in there. But what we don't know is if that blockage is causing a problem. Is, is it causing that patient's heart to get an inadequate amount of blood flow? And one thing we know is that we're notoriously bad at being able to judge which blockages are significant on an angiogram and which are not. And this is where the PET stress can help us because it's giving us a physiologic assessment of those blockages in an individual patient and allows us to determine is that a blockage that needs a mechanical revascularization or not. I received a call from my cardiologist saying, look, you don't need bypass surgery. And the relief of hearing those words was incredible. You know, I kind of joke, I say for your first 18 or 20 years, do whatever you want, enjoy the fried chicken, enjoy your cow. And then after that, um, you really have to focus on risk factors and lifestyle. The vast majority of coronary disease uh, and diabetes and hypertension and high cholesterol can actually be prevented by just good lifestyle. As we age, I think we should be moving into a plant-based diet. And when that isn't good enough, we start adding medicines. The way that it was explained to me is, look, you've got blockage, most of us have blockage. It's the flow which is critical. If I got serious about my diet, and exercising that this would be the best treatment for me. As a former interventionalist, I can say that uh, using pet stress in my own practice has really changed how I treat my patients. I was used to revascularizing or stenting really any tight blockages that we saw on a coronary angiogram. And what I've now found is that with the information from the pet stress, I'm stenting much fewer patients and really getting excellent results just with medical therapy and lifestyle changes. People don't realize this, but you can actually 
unclog arteries just by your diet and exercise. So these are things that we never thought were possible. And oddly enough, the reversal studies showing reversal of uh, coronary disease, the initial studies were done using PET scans.